Okay, so uh, chapter 15, um, which is uh, S4 classes. Uh, that was it. quite interesting, I think. Um, feel free to stop me if um, there's anything that you think is wrong or not quite right all the way through. So I have actually blended some of this with some other presentations. Unfortunately, a bit took too long, which is why I didn't get to the end. Anyhow, <clears throat> um, so basically, we're just going to slightly overview classes and methods because um, I find that that really helped me and potentially maybe any, someone else, anyone else um, who got a little bit lost with this section. Um, and then I'm going to just talk over S4 and, um, you know, this is a little bit stricter than the other methods like S3. And um, we'll just go over a few examples and basically explain the main aspects of like things like inheritance and dispatch um, and hopefully get to the end of that. Okay, um, so basically what is, you know, what is object-oriented programming is basically is a way of conceptualizing cognitive construct, or well, that's the way how I think of it instead. And we tend to do that by defining, um, method, defining things with set class. So we, in which we give it a name and then we implement the aspects of that class within that. Um, so for example, um, when, we when we're creating a class, uh, an example of a class would be something like a linear model, which is whilst um, we have things like, um, say double logical um, uh, lists, you know, these all kind of class, is, but um, for instance, if we were to do an, use an S3 class like a linear model, when we create something with like say empty cars or create a linear model, the outcome when you use the class um, and then put that model in a bracket is, um, is uh, a linear model itself. So it's its own class. That's what we've created. That's why it's useful to create your own thing because if you're dealing with something like sparsity matrix, it's quite useful to create your own class rather than to use classes are already built in, particularly useful if you've got using your own packages as well by the looks of it. Um, so R needs to be adapted to new information types basically. And then, well, what do we do with these? So once you have them, you need to create methods that uh, are useful to those particular classes. And you also need to specify to the generic how to dispatch methods on these things. So generic would be something like summary. So when we apply summary to LM to a class of LM, it will then output the, uh, the summary, the linear model in the particular format of um, its coefficients, typically speaking with the significant values below. Um, anyway, that's what I think about it. And so when we go through the classes, we have things like if we, when we put the, they say 23 in the class, it gives us numeric. When we use uh, a logical, uh, like false, it tells us it's logic. And if we have something like, you know, uh, a string, it says logical, it's not correct, it's character. Uh, and then if we use a linear model, it gives the out class of LM. It's all quite, you know, useful stuff to some extent. Okay, so why do you, why do we want to use it? Uh, S4. Well, it's more rigorous um, than S3. And whilst Hadley does say, you know, typically speaking, you want to use S3 and it's the most useful system, S4 is actually what people often recommend. So if you talk to the people bioconductor or look at their stuff online, they think that's a lot more important because they're using a lot more complex uh, data types. And um, uh, who was it? Uh, Roger Peng, who I paid a, who I watched one of his videos earlier, is he was basically suggesting when you're creating new classes, you should use S4, not S3. So there seems to be a lot of uh, conflict in communities to whether you should use S4 or S3. It seems a lot of people in biomedical sciences tend to think you should be using S4. Um, I'm not going to complain about that. You know, I actually think to some extent it's better, but it does have complexities. Um, so it was released in 2001 uh, in, uh, in R 1.4, and uh, some people think that it's often easier. Um, not really sure who. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, it's loaded automatically in the, the methods package, which should be loaded as default on R, but Hadley recommends that you, um, that you um, load it yourself straight or make sure that you actually 
uh, you know, use the uh, double colon in order to interact with it. So how do you set a class? Um, use the set class to define an S4 function. And it's made up of two, two aspects really, which is the name and slots. And slots are basically the fields that you're assigning information into. So in this particular case, which is used throughout the book, which I think is a bad example, um, it's person. So person has, um, person has a character for the name and the age. So you need to make sure that you specify these aspects here, which are name and age, um, because those and down here, you're defining what goes into those named fields. And then once you've done that, you can then create a new object by using new. And then you actually have your information gone into it. Now, there are better examples of this. And one of them is uh, in Lubridate, where you use period. This is actually one of the questions and actually also one of the answers from the solutions, um, from the solutions book. And what, um, what Lubridate has is, um, it has a period section. So it uses, when you look it up and look at what the slots are going into it, you can see that there are um, there are six slots in total and year, month, day, hour, and minute. And for some reason, seconds is divine, defined as dot data. I don't really, I'm not really sure why that is, um, but one of the important parts are these at symbols. Oh, which I lost. Um, the at symbols are basically the equivalent of the dollar sign. Um, so if we were using uh, the S3 object LM and we've created a uh, fit uh, using LM uh, and use the outcome variable of MPG and predict it on that with HP with empty cars. If we wanted to pick out the coefficient from that, we'd use fit dollar sign uh, coefficient we're doing the same kind of thing with um, with an S4 object, we'd use the at sign instead, which is why when you look at the structure of uh, this example here, which is created using Lubridate, your, um, it splits up into these at signs instead. Um, so you can, uh, an S4 object can be seen, you can see what, whether, what the class of an object is, with it, if it's S4, with the is. So if you've defined the uh, John beforehand, when you put John is, is, blah, is whatever my object is in that area, it will then tell you that it is whatever your class is, which in this case is person. Um, if you want to access the whole, the name which was defined in John Smith, which we just see earlier, then we use the at sign, but you can also go straight for the slot argument and then put in basically John as if you would do a data frame and then select the um, select the aspect of that data frame um, if you were thinking in that like that way, which would be the age. But Hadley says you should avoid that and you should use the app method in your methods, generally speaking. Um, if you're working as uh, with for an, with another developer's class, you should look for their access functions. If you need uh, changes, you should ask them. You know, the same polite notice that you usually get most time of having stuff. Okay. So um, when it comes to setting uh, and, getting inf uh, and getting information from generics or how to set them, you have to create the set in the first place using the set generic function. Um, which you should avoid using the curly braces in, I believe, on oh, no, later on. Anyway, um, so this tells you this tells you how to set the function. So once you've set your age uh, using the using the function over here, um, so you set your generic with the uh, with the signer, which you've added in over here, and then you can set your method, and then you can do either at age or you can. Uh, and then you can also put the assigner in and that allows you to assign values to it, as you can see down here. If you want to find out if something is an S4 method, you need to use sloop. Um, and then you just put O type. So that's just object type. So in this case, when you've defined John, it can tell you that it's S4. If you're asking um, what the, um, what the slot is in John, then it will tell you that um, it's generic. 
I'm not really sure why it does that, actually. Anyone know? Or okay. What were you asking? Why has age got generic next to it? He doesn't actually mention that. It's a generic method, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, set generic age. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry, that's correct. Okay. Um, so as we go on, it's uh, basically we're defining, um, we define S4 classes in upper camel case, which is basically the same throughout. Um, uh, so, and on top of that, character vectors uh, that describe net should be, um, character vectors should describe the names of fields as we saw above. And also one of the other things that you should do that um, you don't technically have to do is have a prototype list. So that's basically a list of defaults. Um, so as you can see over here, we set our person class, uh, we put our fields in, which are name and age, and then we have the prototype list, which is the default, which is basically just the defaults that go into there. And it's highly recommended that you add those in there. So when we define our, our person, um, or a new object, we define that it's going to be the class person, and then we put in our name in the field, which is Hadley, and because the age is missing, it automatically uh, puts in a um, uh, NA uh, real number or uh, missing value for, for numeric. Um, so, oh, that didn't come up very well. Okay, anyway. Um, <clears throat> So um, the set class also allows us to um, utilize inheritance, and we do we set inheritance by um, by set, selecting um, the contain argument. So if we add contain, um, oh, it doesn't look very good when you don't see it like that. Um, basically, you can put person in instead. So if you were to create a new class called employee, you would you you would say you would add, put the argument contains and it will inherit uh, from persons. So when you put in the slots and you say, well, we will create a new slot called person. Um, so what that means is the employee is going to be the type person. And within that, we can also add, um, we can also add the slot boss and the boss will also have person as, uh, as its type, which means that when you have that, it then kind of like builds up a, I suppose, a list on top of itself. If you look in the book, it makes more sense, um, which unfortunately is missing here. Anyway, um, but basically it's inheriting everything from person. So where you slot it in, whether that be in prototypes or whether that be in the, um, whether that be in the slot list, that's where it inherits from. Um, uh, there are apparently nine other arguments in 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 um, the set class, but they're all to be avoided. Um, so you, the only additional argument you should use besides the name and slots and the contains argument is um, sorry, the contains is the only other argument you should use. You shouldn't use um, you shouldn't use any of the other ones because they've either been depreciated or they cause problems elsewhere. Um, so if we want to inspect the class later on, we can say for it, we can use the is function. So is new person and it will tell, tell us that it's person. Uh, and then if we use employee, it will tell us that because it's inherited from person, um, that it's got person in there, but it also inherits class employee that we've created. Sorry, that's what's in it. Um, and if you do a logic test, it will basically show you, um, it will do just do a true or top false, which is quite useful when you're searching through. Um, um, what are we doing here? Redef that's not spelled correctly. In R, both the definition and construct, oh yeah, so both the definition and constructor are run at the same time. So when you're constructing a new object, it's defined when it's constructed. That creates problems when 
um, that creates problems when you are um, re if you tr decide to redefine a class, because when you do so, um, the object that you've defined will change. Uh, sorry, will no longer be able to be read properly because you've changed the because you've redefined the class. So you have to be very careful with that. And this is part of the thing that makes it quite rigorous and why you've got to be quite careful with it. Because while being flexible, it also allows you to make mistakes quite easily. Um, so one of the other things is automatically it will check out uh, whether you're putting in the right kind of uh, classes into the slots. Um, so for instance, if you put um, a character vector into name or into age, the problem, one of the problems is that it doesn't do the, anything else. So you have to define those. So for instance, if you put two age ages into the age into the um, the age method of the um, of the class in the age field, sorry, um, then it won't recognize it as wrong. So in this case, what you need to do is use the set validity function, um, and by doing that and assigning it within the person um, within the person class, when it looks for the um, when it looks for the age, it will also check out whether the age is the same length as the name, or I suppose you could do it an easy way if you wanted to. Um, oh, I think I made a mistake there. Uh, anyway, so basically this is, um, this is, I think this is the same thing I was saying earlier, which is if you redefine it, if you redefine something later on, then um, when you've later when you later modify oh sorry no it's not quite the same if you modify uh, an aspect of something that you, of an object that you've created the validity object function won't pick it up because it only does it when you create a new object but it doesn't do it when you've run a um, it doesn't do it when you've altered an object later on so you have to then recheck with valid object. It's, and that way it will bring up the um, whether something was an invalid class or not. Um, so to set the generics, um, again, it's lower camel, camel case in order when you're setting them. And um, there is basically, it's, it's pretty straightforward to be honest, you give the name of the generic uh, and the function, and then you just set that as standard generic. But you can also put in a signature value as well, which allows you to control arguments like whether it's verbose or whether it's uh, printed or not. Um, printed in S4 is used as a show method instead, um, which is one of the ways that you can control how, uh, what you can see after you create a uh, S4 class. Um, so, uh, and how you define the actual methods is with step method. So what you do there is you basically say well this is this forms this kind of generic and we're using these kind of class and then you set your function in there um it, there's not really an awful lot into that the best examples of this are on bioconductor i believe um but there's also a course error course by john hopkins university which actually does this quite well as well um and we've already mentioned show, which is the way to do it. That's not come up too well, sorry. Um, and that's about it. Um, so one of the main things that I haven't really got onto are, um, there are two things, which is that you can cross over S3 and S4 in uh, generics, um, but it's not recommended uh, to, so you can, it's possible to convert an S3 to an S4 generic, but it does create problems and you need to be very careful when you do that. Um, you should avoid converting regular functions to S4 generics in packages because it requires careful coordination if done by multiple, if done by multiple packages. Um, the, me, the main issue with S4 generics appear, is um, the dispatch method. So that's the um, pages with the emojis on it, if you look at those. And what the problems with that is that um, it appears quite simple at first, but because of multiple inheritance, um, 
it can get quite complex as to what um, what method is uh, inheriting from. And because it goes so essentially, if things are the same, if you're using multiple inheritance and the distance between um, methods is the same, then there is then it resolves which method to use by using uh, alphabetical order. The problem with doing that is that um, it's Hadley, as Hadley says, it's essentially random. So that creates problems for you. So you can use this method and it can be quite useful, but at the same time, you need to build up a map of um, what methods going in what order because otherwise it becomes very complex very quickly. And that's about it. Does anyone have any thoughts on the multiple dispatch? It's confusing. Mm. I have personally not used this before. So based on the way that S4 objects are presented, it seems like they're better when you're building tools for other people to use. and. I don't know, I guess that's just my big takeaway um, because I don't do a lot of tool building in the way that I use R right now. Mm. But do you guys, is there any other application that you find popping up a lot or do any of you have a lot of experience with S4 objects or object-oriented systems? Um, I, don't, I don't really use S4, um, but it's already implemented in different classes, so it can be useful in a way. Um, you, you could also, I suppose it's more useful if you're making packages as well. I don't, um, I don't really know because I've never really made a package. I just tend to use uh, functions and things that are already there. Um, but you, uh, like, like I mentioned before, you can actually convert um, other classes, well, S3 classes to S4 classes using um, set old class, and it just converts it across. But um, again, Hadley also says that you should use, um, when you're setting old classes, you're actually better off um, defining it uh, by, uh, by capturing it. So it's generally better to be more specific and provide a full definition with the slots and process types rather than use the set old class types, is what it says. And that's at the end of the um, that's right at the end. I actually think that should go earlier in the book. But the multiple inheritance part is confusing. Um, multiple dispatch is a bit easier than multiple inheritance, I think. Anyway. Yeah, I haven't defined any S4 methods, but I've used it in like the SF. SF converts all the spatial data to S4 objects. I think also with like net network graphs, I had to use S4. It was semi confusing when I first like encountered it for sure, but you get used to it, using it anyway. Building method sounds like fairly confusing because of the dispatch system. Did anyone do the um, do the questions? I just read the answers <laughs> mostly. I did one of them. Um, I did a fun thing with one of the questions or a couple of the questions. Uh, let me see if I can get my computer on here. Also, I just shared the link to the um, sign up sheet in the chat because next week, well, I put together a little Kahoot competition. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, basically, that? instead of presenting slides, it's set up 
sort of like a game show, but where you like either use your computer or your phone and you select an answer to questions that are presented and you get points based on how fast you respond and if it's the right answer. Hmm. Um, as a way to review this section, I figured that'd be more fun. And then we go into meta programming. That's a good that idea. Cool. Who's going to make that? How do you make that? Um, it's free. Uh, so I started it. Okay. We will see. It should work pretty well in the Zoom format. <laughs> so we're going to do that with like everything in this section? Yeah. Uh huh. So it'll largely review the stuff in chapter 16, but I'm going to include a little bit from everything. Okay. For extra challenge to see what we all remember. <laughs> that sounds fun. fun. Um, I can show you the thing I did with the S4 if you're done sharing. It's like your um, characters, but it, if you copied them and pasted, it looks like the back ticks like, are not all back ticks. I can't really tell. Oh, my computer. <laughs> it's too tiny for me to see, actually. I tend to have the uh, resolution right down so I can see as much on the screen as possible. It's uh, uh, also one of the reasons why I make so many grammatical mistakes. That and being dyslexic, but you know. Um, yeah. Oh, there we go. It works. <laughs> yeah, I think it's so sometimes when you um, put your code together on the presentations, it doesn't like it. Um, yeah. And it just uh, the, um, screws up all the formatting, which makes it really annoying. The other problem is that I didn't really want to use Hadley's examples because I thought they were too contrived. Um, I mean, he says at the beginning, it's really just to explain the explain it to you. But I think the best examples are, um, he links to Bioconductor, but there is, um, I'll add it to the chat. There is this video by, um, there is this video by, um, oh, where's the, where's the chat? There's this video by one of the people from Bioconductor. Um, there's also, uh, if you've got access to Datacamp, there's that, uh, <laughs> probably avoid. But like, um, <laughs> um, if you do, then there is some videos by people from Bioconductor uh, on Datacamp as well, along with some stuff on all object oriented programming. Uh, personally, I prefer Coursera. Um, and also this video, these videos for free by uh, by Roger Pang from uh, uh, sorry Ro Roger Peng from the uh, John Hopkins University, and he's awesome to be honest. That course is really good. Oh, anyway, uh, I'll stop sharing. That's cool. Uh, where's my R session? Here it is. Did that share? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, I'll try to make it a little bit bigger. So it's pretty simple. Uh, I was building that R6 class for WebSockets. So I've been messing around with the CLI package. And the CLI package kind of lets you put stuff in the console with special formatting or colors. Uh, and it's the you see it fairly often in the tidyverse. They use it often in the packages. So put together this thing. One sec. This did an error earlier. Don't know why it is now. Okay, so I just made like a custom print method for this. There it goes. So it uses the GR devices rainbow and then maps along all the methods with each of the colors from the rainbow call and then uses each of those functions to display each of the objects in the in the, the S4 class person. 
it was fun doing that. So CLI, it's a fun package if you get a chance to check it out. If you want to have your console be very mm, accented to keep track of what's going on in it, it definitely helps for that. That's it. Yeah, it's a tricky subject, isn't it? Uh, that's really nice code, Stephen. Although not as nice as the uh, bit of code you did for the, um, what's it, uh, for the events for uh, R Studio Global. That was really good. I wasn't able to attend. Um, how was that? Um, sorry. Uh, it was really good in parts. Um, it's like the problem is, is each talk's really, really quick, mm. like un oh. like abnormally quick for a conference. Like, um, because I used to be an academic, I used to go to conferences, people speaking for half an hour at a time, or f at least fifteen minutes. There is like there's talks that are seven minutes long, mm. and like trying to get out some pretty dense information really, really quickly. Um. Yeah. <laughs> it flew great by. Sorry. I agree. It flew by. Mm. So that's not something that's ubiquitous across industry focused conferences. You think it was just a unique R conference thing? I, I think it's a trend of conferences to go shorter. Mm. Mm. I guess they're it's so worried like about Zoom fatigue. <laughs> It's a bit like it's a bit like um reminds me of um research journals. When you used to get mm. a journal article, they used to be like quite a bit longer, and that's only like fifteen years ago. And now, when you get them, they've got to be like a maximum of seven pages long, including references. And it's like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's no wonder like you know you get a student to read it, or <laughs> they're like, "What's this mean?" And you have to go back yeah. to all your references in order to read it. Um, well, that's how I felt at the end. Um, but the conference, the conference itself is... has those same slots, though. Even when like people are walking between, mm. it was crazy making. They had them on like five minute segments, and you were literally like had two minutes to get from one session to another on the other side of the hotel, Ooh. and then there was like five minutes for that session before the next one came up, and I just mm. felt like it was just a little a little insane, but that's how they had it at the actual in-person conference in 2020. Maybe the goal was since people normally sit so much at their computers using R, they really want to get people moving around. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Well, in the R conference, the virtual one, there was no gap. Like the 2021, there was no gap. It was just like they'd start a stream Mm. for the day and that would just show them back to back and the people all edited it to be exactly like five minutes and so if you were watching like track a it would just be like five minutes five minutes five minutes five minutes and you could just like watch straight through presentation to presentation mm -hmm. which feels a, a lot bit. less crazy than trying to sprint across the hotel to get to the other one. <laughs> What were you saying, I watched, I watched a couple in the morning, and I thought they were 15-minute ones. But, like, I watched um, the blind, the non-visual accessibility talk. Hmm. And... Oh, yeah. Oh, they gradually get faster, is what it is. Like, they start yeah. with workshops... When it was in person, it was three days of workshops leading up all day long. This year, there was only one day of workshops, and it was only like a two-hour segment. And those mm -hmm. were informative. And then they go to like 30-minute segments, and then 20-minute segments, or 15, 20 or 15, and then down to five-minute segments. The conference does the same thing. It like gets smaller and smaller segments as it progresses. Mm -hmm. 
What did you think was uh, the best talk? Uh, by far, for me, it was the the shiny presentation by uh, Absalon. There were like so many tips and things in there that I hadn't thought of about how to make shiny apps run faster. And then runner up would be Winston Chang's talk about the new shiny feature called Vine Cache uh, that allows you to like cache output based on a specific inputs. So when people go to like load a tab, they're like flipping between tabs. If they're not changing any values, it's not going to recalculate everything, which is a nice feature. They actually made the dashboard for, he said they made the dashboard for the state of California, the COVID dashboard. Mm -hmm. And so they had to figure out like some new ways of serving data, like really quick up to a hundred thousand users at a time Mm -hmm. on a shiny app. And so they kind of had to invent this new method to do that. That's really cool. I didn't see that one. Um, the what the the one that I really liked were all to do with like modeling systems. So like Max Coons were really his was his was good, and you know everyone else who kind of followed on from that. There was one about um, what was it? I wrote it down. Uh, sequential testing, which I thought was really cool in a way of like reducing down the amount of time and. Uh, the volume of information you need in order to do a, like an A/B test, but um, the Apache Spark, sorry, Apache Arrow was the one that blew my mind the most. That was really cool. Um, that's incredibly fast. It's really like you know, I think that's probably um, going to be a game changer in terms of like um, analyzing data in R and also locally, more importantly. Uh, but I'd recommend any, anyone likes, you know, go to watch the video on that because that's a really important one. Well, dear. Interesting. I missed that talk. I'm going to definitely check it out when they post them all. Yeah, I, like there's a few I missed that I'd really like to see as well. Um, particularly, you know, just like the whole tidy models stuff's really good. I think I missed uh, Julie Silge's talk. As well, which um, you know, never, never particularly good because you know anyone in that group's really good. Yeah. Well, right, they should just put all those on YouTube, right? Yeah, they're gonna post they're all gonna of po- them. Yeah, on the resources page on our studio.com. Awesome. Thank you. Do they post the presentations as well? Oh, sorry, these slides. Uh, I don't I know. Know. Yeah, I only watched like four talks. <laughs> I have such a I can't pay attention anymore since everything is remote. <laughs> <laughs> I found yeah. myself getting between work and uh, watching talks, like, you know, a little bit of time between. I was, like, um, going through a, a pretty hard few days of, like, rebuilding models. Um, and it was just, you know, my attention was half drawn to one thing and half drawn to another. It, it, like, I wasn't really able to pay enough attention to some of the talks because they're going so fast. Did you guys go in like the spatial chat thing at all? I never did. Um, I did a little bit actually. Um, there was one, there was one person who did see on there who um, basically made had a massive impact on my life, although he probably doesn't know it. Um, called Mark Edmondson, and uh, Mark Edmondson basically created uh, the main API that people use for Google Analytics. And when I was doing like digital marketing, like he just made my life so easy. In fact, he created this shiny app called. Um, was it a uh, causal effect, which is based on the causal impact, um, causal impact uh, package, which uh, I think Google created, which is a really good way of doing an A/B test when you can't do an A/B test. Um, so if you want to like see an impact of like a, on a on a website of like creating a new web new website and uh, how people respond over time and how, what that you expect them to, basically does a B uh, BSTS model in the background. And then allows you to basically compare 
the forecast of that model with what actually happens later on, which uh, which I think is really really cool. But uh, there were some there's some really other there's some really great ones as well. Like uh, certain groups really shared like their GitHub pages, which had a lot of content. Uh, uh, I thought the people who do sports analytics was they had some really good ones, but um, like you know, you look at financial, you think, oh, that's a group of people is going to do some really really yeah. good analytics, but they did no one shared a GitHub page on that, which was a bit disappointed by. <laughs> I was also disappointed not to see the people from like um, what's it called, business science, you know, the uh, yeah. was it Matt Denko yeah. or whatever. Uh, you, you know, I'd quite like to see him because they do some amazing stuff. Anyway, sorry, that was a bit of a spiel. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, there's one more thing for the bioconductive thing. Um, I think this is the one that Hadley links to, actually. So I just added that in there. Um, If you do get interested at all. Um, I do think it's it's quite useful working on this because it's quite interesting to learn about these methods. It's just, it's just really hard to get your head around why it is that you'd create a class if you don't need to. And you have to find a justification for that. And it seems a lot more of a developer kind of thing than you know, if you're a statistician or doing statistics or AI. Um, sorry, not AI. Uh, well, you put AI if you want. Uh, neural networks or whatever. Most of them have already been created. But... Um, you know, if you take like like some some of the um, neural nets that have been created, they already have built-in sparsity uh, matrices. So you don't need to create those yourself anyhow. Um, so I guess it's only really valid if you were creating like say a completely new method or or trying to define one which you found in a research paper, which is really challenging. Um, yeah. Has anyone found any uses for like doing, you know, any of using any of the other systems on a regular basis? I mean, I just finished doing that R6 class, still debugging it, but it seems to be working out. I'm wondering if anybody has any advice for like what to do when. So I figured out that question I asked on the S3DA about how to retain the class attributes using like mutate. Yeah. Um, and I looked through the, the civil package and we were close. Torin, what you pointed out was close to dplyr verbs. Down in mm-hmm. there, there was like mutate modify call which is like an internal function from uh, the, the dplyr package that actually does part of the mutation. Mm-hmm. And so they added an S3 method for that. So it's like inside of mutate. And basically I would have to like take their code and like modify it slightly to be able to build a class on top of the civil what they've already done there or like get them to export that particular method and i was wondering if anybody has an experience on like what to do when you're building on top of somebody else's class like just ask them to export it or like can i copy your code what do you do does anybody know i think in the book they suggest Oh, sorry. Uh, I think in the book they suggest you should contact them, but then I I feel like that's a dream because they're usually like they're usually busy people. And it's not like you can tell them, "Oh, I, I would like you to add this to your package because I needed to integrate uh, with what I'm doing." And maybe sometimes you send a pull a pull request, but then that might break something else. And so they might say, oh, no, we don't want that. So I guess I will look into the licensing of the code and maybe try to bring some of that into your package or into your code if if it's feasible. But then 
it depends what you want that for. If it's, I don't know, something for work and it has a commercial application, I work for you, then that might be a different story with the licensing. And I think in the R packages um, book club, they talk about that licensing and bringing code from other places into your package or into your workflow. Okay. Because I personally feel like that's the easiest way than trying to convince someone to um, make some modifications to their code or to the package. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you're lucky and you had the amazing idea and they are like, oh yeah, I like that. Let's put it in the package. Or well, who knows? Yeah, I think, yeah, that I'll probably just look at a license first and see if I can do it on my own. It's an AGPL package that I'm making. So like if theirs is a similar license, then I might be able to do it just by copying it. Otherwise, I think I just have to ask them to like export that particular method so I can call it without getting an error for exporting an internal method from another package. Um, and I, I don't, I feel like that's not that hard. It's just like at export and then it's just sitting there in the list. It'll look weird because it's an internal method, but I don't know. They might be okay with it. I'll just try to do it myself first based on comparing the licenses and then go from there. Thanks. Thanks for the help, Robert. Can you say your name for me? I feel like I pronounce it different every single time and I don't know which is the correct one. Yeah. Uh, I said Roberto. Roberto, okay. Yeah, but then when I lived in the US, I got used to Roberto, which I used to hate at the beginning. But I was like, just say Robert O. And I was like, oh, whatever you want to call me. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Roberto, got it. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thanks.